Hello everybody, um, it's two o'clock and welcome to our webinar. I'm Emily Crossley, co-founder of Duchenne UK and mum to Eli with Duchenne. And I'm also joined on the line by Alex Johnson, also co-founder of Duchenne UK, founder of Joining Jack and mum to Jack. Thank you all for joining us again. This is our second webinar to help you navigate your way through these unprecedented and sometimes frightening times. Guidance has at times been confusing and many families are in unique situations, which means that sometimes the general guidance can be unhelpful. So we're changing the format of this webinar a little bit to allow you to send us questions during the discussions. And we will try to cover as many of them as you can. So just use the Q&A button in the Zoom toolbar at the top and we'll try to get through as many of those answers as we can. Anything, of course, we can't answer now, we will go away and help to provide you with answers at a later date. So we're very pleased today to be joined by Dr. Michaela Guglieri, a neurologist from the John Walton Muscular Dystrophy Research Centre in Newcastle, who's fitting us in in between her clinics and has promised to answer as many questions as possible in the next 45 minutes. So thank you so much for joining us, Michaela. Hello, um, everyone. <laughs> nice to have you. Um, so we've had a lot of questions around the government advice on shielding issued last week. And I think one of the reasons for this is because not everybody has received the letters from the NHS or their GP to say that they are in the vulnerable group. So to get this question out of the way first, should all patients with DMD, regardless of whether or not they've been contacted, be following the shielding guidelines? Yeah, this, um, I, I, anyway, um, there is some confusion regarding this. And probably the best way, way to reply to, this, um, to answer this question is really for me to put the context how the message was sent out and how the criteria was, were defined. So as you know, the, um, on the, uh, last week the government advised for a, uh, highly or extremely vulnerable people to shielding. However, the government also provides some information regarding which patient, which category of patient should have been considered highly vulnerable. And it's very difficult for anyone to come out with a complete and full list. So although some specific conditions were listed, such as cancer or patients with a severe uh, immune um, suppressive conditions, for other categories where vague criteria were, were provided. And therefore, the neuromuscular patients, for example, were not specifically listed in that, uh, in that group. We, however, had a discussion uh, with the clinician across the, the, the UK on whether patients with neuromuscular conditions should be considered highly vulnerable. And the general message why patients should be considered highly vulnerable is because patients might have a higher risk to develop severe complications in case of uh, infection from COVID-19. The risk of complication is, is mainly related to the uh, ability of their body to respond to infection and therefore on their immune system, is related to their respiratory function and therefore if they have already um, comorbidities, means other conditions that they can impair uh, their respiratory function, that means that if they get an infection that affects their uh, lungs, this can develop more severe symptoms. Other Comorbidities or other conditions that are considered a risk are, for example, malnutrition or uh, heart problems. If we think about this, it means clearly that some of the neuromuscular patients are clearly at high risk and should be considered as extremely vulnerable patients. It does not strictly apply to everyone. The different message is that it came from the fact that it's very difficult in a very time manner and quickly to provide each single patient at risk and identify which patients are at risk and which patients are not at risk. And what is exactly the criteria? What is that criteria in terms of respiratory function that puts you on a higher or lower risk? So the general approach has been that we play on the safe side and advise to put every single patient with a neuromuscular condition at risk. Some centers might be able to actually have the capacity to go to look at a single patient and make this call patient by patient. But most of the centers that see a large group of, of patients have made the call to play on the safe side and send the letter or the information to all patients. This is why there is a little bit of discrepancy. 
The message that was sent out from NHS England was based on patients that were considered at risk and patients that were previously advised to receive a flu jab or a flu vaccine. But this was a list that was clearly incomplete and was asked, NHS England asked um, help from GPs and neuromuscular specialists in order to ensure that everybody received the same message. That is why there is a little bit of discrepancy. As a general uh, message, I would say that we should follow the uh, uh, recommendation from the government that everybody should be self-isolating. There are patients, all patients with neuromuscular disease should consider shielding, but this might be then a, um, an assessment that everybody does in terms of their own risk based on their general um, health. Okay, thank you for clarifying that, Michaela. So the next question, which sort of follows on to this, um, from a mum who says her sons are five and two, neither of them are on steroids at the moment, are they still considered to be high risk? So I suppose the question is, are patients high risk because of their steroid regime or because of the diagnosis of DMD? I think that what we say that all patients with Duchenne cell dystrophy that are on steroids should be considered at high risk. And because as we know, steroids can have an impact on the, their immune system. Uh, boys who have steroid, but at the age of two and five, we do not ex um, uh, uh, that are not on steroid and at the age of two and five, we would not expect them to have any heart or respiratory problem, and therefore should not be probably included in the high risk population. But I put a few conditions to say they should not have a heart or respiratory problem when we know that there is a very small group of young children with Duchenne that might have heart problem at early age. So in these cases, we might make a different call. But as a general rule, I would say five or two-year-old boys with Duchenne should still self-isolate, should still be careful about social distancing and strict guidance, but are not probably fit the criteria for the high-risk population. Thank you so much. We need to take into account. We need to take into account that there is no. Uh, evidence so far that patients with neuromuscular diseases has an increased risk to uh, um, get infected by COVID-19. What we are managing is the risk of complication in case they get it. Okay, thank you. Um, so I think you, you've covered the next question, which is what should parents do if they are key workers and have to go to work if their child has DMD, should they be going to work? Is it the case that they just have to, the child has to I mean, if this is possible to isolate at home and they follow shielding practices at home when they come back from work, or should they be exempted from work? So this is, uh, is something that um, is still largely uh, unknown and unclear. And there are different uh, considerations to be kept in mind in this perspective. Although we know that the boys with Duchenne on corticosteroid are at the higher risk and they should shielding, as I mentioned now, um, obviously if we think about either a child or a uh, young adult or adult with Duchenne, they uh, are highly dependent by other, uh, by carer and quite often by family members that take care and parents that take care of them. And therefore, if someone have, uh, applies shielding, also the main carer would be, should be recommended to um, uh, follow strict self-isolation um, measure. The current government guidance do not recommend shoulder, shielding for other uh, people living in the same house. But obviously, a consideration needs to be made if this person cannot really perform a self-isolation because is the main carer and therefore taking care of personal hygiene and day-to-day -day care of the patient or of the person that is extremely vulnerable. At the same time, we, it's very difficult as a clinician to advise to uh, parents that both parents, for example, of every patient with a neuromuscular condition or everyone living in the house with a patient with a neuromuscular condition should be allowed of work if they are key workers, because obviously we need in the society the key workers. And if we start and advise everyone to stay at home, that will be have an impact on the general society. So I would say that the person who is the main carer should try to 
to, to follow strict self-isolation rules and if uh, uh, not possible should be or if it involves in personal hygiene and direct contact with the, with the affected person should be shielding when other family member or other people living with the, with the person which is considered extremely vulnerable should uh, follow very strict self-isolation rules. Okay, thank you. Um, we had many parents asking what they should do if they haven't yet received a letter from their GP or from the NHS saying that their son is considered high risk. Should they contact their GP or their neuromuscular centre? What would you advise? My advice would be if there's a patient, as the, uh, there is also a statement both on the UK that and the UK to say that the clinicians have made a call that any patient with neuromuscular condition should be considered at high risk. Um, and therefore should shielding, and this is, this is the advice, with or without the letter from the GP. In case the letter of the GP is needed for a parent in order to uh, um, obtain, for example, the permission to work from home, in that case, yes, get in touch with the GP or the neuromuscular specialist. But it's not the lack of the letter from the GP that should actually uh, make any difference in what the patient does. Okay, thank you. Um, Alex, I think we've received a couple of questions during this discussion. Do you want to put something to Michaela? Yeah, we've had two questions in. So the first question is uh, from Alex Clark. His son was due to have new splints fitted. The appointment has been cancelled, but we have been informed that they will move it from his usual hospital to another location in the next four weeks. Under the shielding guidelines, should we still attend this appointment? I do apologise, Alex, I missed the first part of the question. The connection wasn't very good. No worries. It's about a splint fitting and the appointment was cancelled. It's been moved to another hospital in four weeks' time, but under the shielding guidelines, should they, should they attend that appointment? So, in the general advice is that all non-emergency appointments in the hospital should not be, should be postponed uh, and therefore and especially under the shielding advice they should not attend appointment within the next 12 weeks. These calls however are made on a case-by-case uh, -case, uh, assessment because we need to, to balance benefit and risk. So what is the benefit from the appointment versus the potential risk to be infected by coronavirus attending a hospital appointment. Generally, that is why the call is about non-emergency treatment should be postponed. So the answer the question? Yeah, there was one more question. I'm not sure whether you'll be able to answer this one, but I'm just gonna ask it. Um, it's from a lady who has two boys with Dushan. They've only received a letter for her youngest son to say he is considered vulnerable. He has very early, he's in the very early stages of kidney disease as one kidney only works at 25%. Uh, this is an extra health problem. Would that make him more vulnerable as my five-year-old who didn't get a letter is otherwise generally healthy? I do apologize. Alex, I really struggle to hear your question. So, okay. is there, is there, I have two boys, I might have be able to read it, this boy who have two boys with Duchenne. Yeah. Uh, the youngest has received the letter to be considered as vulnerable. Yeah. Um, very early stage of kidney disease, as one kidney only work at 25%. Yes. So. I would say that, um, in a way, the uh, the presence of an underlying uh, uh, another condition, such as a kidney disease, put the boys on a higher risk compared to a, a boy with a similar uh, condition, a similar boy with only Duchenne muscle dystrophy. Okay. Thank you, Michaela. Thank you, Michaela, and thanks, Alex. Okay. So the next. Um, a couple of questions are about uh, pulmonary um, and lung function. Um, so my 20 year old uses a BiPAP at night but breathes unassisted during the day. If he's infected with coronavirus, will the BiPAP help him? And could we use it all day to help him breathe? And would this make a difference? 
Okay, the general advice is that the people who are currently on uh, ventilatory support at night or at day should continue to use their ventilatory support as they are doing at the moment and do not discontinue because of the potential risk of coronavirus infection. Should they contract the coronavirus, the point is that one of the aspects of the infection is that patients develop a breathing problem. So there is the possibility that the people uh, who have already compromised breathing uh, and a compromised respiratory function might require additional respiratory support during the infection. And therefore, it's possible that they might require to use their ventilatory support more often, for example, from a person who just uses it at night to use it during the day. So to specifically ask, yes, if uh, uh, they get the coronavirus and they start developing respiratory uh, symptoms, the fact that they have the BPAP will help them to go through it. It is very difficult to make a call whether this will be enough, but definitely will help them to go through the infection. And the other thing is that, yes, it's possible that during the infection they might need to use their ventilatory support more often, but there, are, there is no evidence that starting using the ventilator more often protects them from the infection or from the complication of the infection as a prophylaxis. Okay, so the next question is, if someone with Duchenne becomes infected and hospitals are full so they can't be admitted, what can we do for them using the resources that we already have? Um, for example, could we use a BiPAP and cough assist machine? Should we increase the dose of their steroids? So two aspects here. So if someone with Duchenne uh, muscle dystrophy is in, uh, become infected, become symptomatic, uh, and the, the hospital are full, my first advice would be to get in touch with your uh, muscle specialist. That would be the first important message and or with your respiratory team because if a patient is already on BPAP or respiratory support and has a BPAP machine or a cough assist machine, they, it means that they have a respiratory team involved in the patient care. And this team must be informed as soon as the patient develops symptoms um, of respiratory problems. The second question regarding increasing the, the dose of steroids is, um, in general, I would say that uh, we, we all know that the patients that are on long-term treatment with corticosteroid has a potential risk of uh, adrenal uh, crisis during uh, moderate or severe illnesses or uh, surgery or trauma. And I would say that an infection of coronavirus should be considered as a moderate uh, illness. Therefore, the general recommendation is that they should increase the dose of steroid in case they develop uh, flu-like symptoms that are worse than a normal cold. The problem in the UK, I don't want to be uh, strict on say whether they are infected by coronavirus because they might have symptoms but do not know whether they are due for coronavirus or not because they are not tested unless they end up in hospital. So it, the, the, the trigger of uh, respiratory support or increased steroid has to be the symptoms that the, in general, the common sense is about symptoms that are similar to a flu, but are worse than a common cold. Thanks, Michaela. Um, we're actually going to be talking about uh, the steroid stress dosing in, in a moment. And we're also going to be yeah. talking about potentially writing your own emergency plan. Because I suppose the only thing that struck me from what you just said is, you know, what happens if your child um, starts to develop symptoms on Friday night or on a Saturday morning when it's, it's often very difficult to reach the neuromuscular teams? Um, would you like to answer that now or should we wait until we get to this section on planning for an emergency? Um, well, it's the same for me. I think that I answer here because there are two aspects. One is the respiratory and one is the steroid. For the steroid, we can go into the details before, uh, after. Yeah. But in general, for the steroid, I think that you should have uh, a plan in place about what to do in case of illness prior it happens. There are different strategies, and we'll discuss the different strategies later on, but it's important that each single patient has a plan in place, whatever the plan is, but as some information from the neuromuscular specialist, when the boys or the young man or the man 
is healthy and well, what to do in case it becomes unwell and not to just react when something goes wrong. And the same would be useful for the patients that are on uh, respiratory support to discuss this with the respiratory team um, while the, the patient is still well. Generally, for the respiratory team, they provide a, uh, a emergency contact uh, in case they are suddenly unwell. Um, so, are, is the North Star Network providing a sort of generic or, or um, blueprint for each disease phase um, that could then be personalised to each patient, or is it? Are you suggesting that patients need to approach their neuromuscular clinic and write an emergency plan from scratch specific to their their child or their adult? I, I think. I think that the point is that we are in a, situ in a, a particular situation when we want to provide information as quickly as possible. So having a person, uh, having from a neuromuscular uh, centers to have a personalized uh, plan for each single patient is possible, but might require time. And that is the time that at the moment we do not have. If I provide a patient with a plan in three weeks time, what does the patient need to do over the next three weeks while waiting for that personalized plan? So in general, we are discussing, it would be ideal if all the North Star network would find a agreement and come out with one message for all patients in, in the UK, but this is not always possible. And the reason why it's not always possible is because the context is different and the, the information that has been provided until this uh, emergency time are different. And therefore, we do not want actually to miss much information and uh, um, come out with messages that contradict a message that was given three months ago and that is still absolutely valid. So I would say that each single center has developing, are developing strategies about, for example, what to do in case of steroid or what to do in case of respiratory problem in, with, with the BPAP and the cough assist. I think that it's fair that if the patient has not received any information on this or does not receive any information that on this within the next week, to contact the neuromuscular center asking for some information. Okay, thank you very much for that, Michaela. That's very useful. And we're actually in, in conversation with the other UK charities um, to get up-to-date guidance every week from, from some of the neuromuscular clinicians in the North Star. So perhaps this is something we can pick up with them and see how we might be of any help. So thank you for that. Um, so the next question, are carers allowed to access personal protection equipment? Uh, is anybody making them available? And do you have any ideas of where families might be able to get them from? No, at the moment, uh, the uh, government does not advise personal protection equipment for carer, for um, parents, okay? Um, and therefore, these are not provided. It's different if the care is provided by an independent service, and the independent service should provide personal protection equipment, and um, to provide themselves the personal protection equipment. And this is the reason because obviously with parents, we assume that the patient will live every day with, with the person. With the external carer, they move from one uh, patient to another. And the personal protection equipment is to reduce the risk of infection from people who uh, are more exposed to the community. Okay, thank you. We'll go to our next question now. Um, I'm not sure whether you've heard of this, but we've had reports of a 29-year-old man with Duchenne surviving coronavirus. He was hospitalized, but he has now gone home. Um, do you know anything about his case and what, if anything, we can learn? And do you know whether or not any more people with Duchenne have contracted COVID-19 and what were the outcomes? Um, I, the only thing, I can't really make any comment on this specific case because the only information that I have are is what is I mean, let's say available uh, online, uh, but I don't have any additional information compared to all of you, and, very, and therefore it's very difficult to make any com any medical comment when you do not know the specific circumstances of this patient. 
I uh, actually ahead of this call, I contacted the Commission in, in, in the UK and there has been some international conversation. And apparently, there is no much information about any patient with shell muscle dystrophy that um, uh, were, was in, infected by COVID-19. And this can be, for different reasons, can be uh, under-reported um, circumstance or event or it could be that uh, they do not seem to uh, contract the infection as uh, easily. And it's very difficult at this point for me to make a comment about which one of the three that we explain where I would not want to be a family except of this one that has been infected by COVID-19 and what was the outcome. The general point is that, as you know, COVID-19 uh, uh, seems to affect children in a milder form compared to adults. There are a few cases of uh, children uh, with uh, COVID-19 positive who um, uh, were admitted to hospital, but this are a very small number and they generally recover well unless they have other severe comorbidities or other severe conditions ongoing. Um, and these apply also for children with shell muscle dystrophy. This is specifically talking about children. So there is no reason why children with shell muscle dystrophy should have an increased risk to um, contract COVID-19. The effect of steroid on the immune system is there is a possibility that they are an increased risk because they are on steroid that suppress their immune system. But if we think about it, it's also true that the really boys with shell muscle dystrophy um, uh, get ill or get more infection compared to the general uh, population or compared to brothers or other family members. And uh, uh, the fact that so far there's not been cases or several cases of shell muscle dystrophy that contracted uh, the virus and that complication, I think that should be seen as a positive sign. Okay, thank you, Michaela. Um, Alex, you had a question. Yeah, we've got one question uh, from John, who says, Hi, Michaela, hope you're well. My son Joseph is on Vimorolone. Should he develop flu-like symptoms? Should I increase his Vimorolone dosage or give hydrocortisone? He is on four mils of vermorolone currently. Should I just give a double dose if he becomes ill? Thank you. Um, this is, I answer as much as, as, as much as I can. Um, we need to consider that I'm also the study chair for the vermorolone study. So here I'm acting as a clinician, taking care of patient and some of them on the vermorolone study and not as a study chair of the vermorolone. Uh, VBP15004 study, and this is a, a disclosure that I have to make. Um, I the, the problem is that Vamoralon is still an investigational, considered an investigational drug, and is not a licensed drug. And therefore, I do not feel comfortable to uh, advise, and the sponsor has not advised patient to double the dose of Vamoralon, similarly to what we might recommend with uh, uh, traditional corticosteroids such as prednisone or the Flazacord. Every patient as part of the clinical trial, every patient has received an emergency card which recommend hydrocortisone in case of moderate or um, severe illness and that are the instructions that should be followed. So any stress that those in case of flu-like symptoms should be uh, made through well-known and licensed drugs such as hydrocortisone and not with memorandum. Okay, thanks, Michaela. Um, these are just comments, not questions, from Philippa Farrant. Um, she would like me to tell you that most of the older boys will have had some sort of conversation with their specialist regarding emergency plans, irrespective of COVID-19, if only verbal, though again, I suspect that differs across the country. And she also said there was a three-year-old boy in Southampton with COVID-19 they suspected, but still awaiting results on the test, but also now transpires he has Becca. He went home with meds and steroids. So just two comments there from Philippa. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Thank you, Philippa. Um, okay, so let's go back to this um, issue of steroids and the hydrocortisone injection pack. We actually 
discussed this last week with Francesco, we've had quite a number of emails and questions about the pack. Um, some neuromuscular clinics we know are giving them out, others are in the process of contacting patients about them. Um, we just thought it would be helpful to put on this slide um, some guidance that we've I've received from Great Ormond Street Hospital, which shows an image of what your emergency pack should look like and what each pack should contain. Um, would you mind just briefly talking us through um, what a hydrocortisone injection pack is, Michaela, and when people would need to use it? Yeah. So, um, we need to, first, we need to be absolutely clear that every patient that uh, has been receiving corticosteroid, which means prednisone or deflazacut, for a period of time uh, longer than uh, three to six months, are at risk of adrenal suppression. So, are actually uh, adrenal suppression at risk of adrenal crisis. This means that because they are receiving corticosteroid through a tablet, their body stop producing corticosteroid. This in normal situation is absolutely fine, but our body usually uh, resp responded to physic physical stress, such as a severe infection or trauma or the stress induced by major surgery, increasing the amount of steroid that the body produces. And this steroid is important to maintain the breathing rate, the heart rate, the glucose level, the sugar level in the blood. So the problem here is that if the patients are uh, um, taking steroid chronically so for a long period of time, some of them are not able to produce this extra amount of steroid that is required in case of stressful situation. And that is what is the adrenal suppression and if they do not produce this extra uh, amount of uh, steroid when it's needed, they might in, uh, go into an adrenal crisis, which means that they start developing symptoms with low glucose um, levels and feeling uh, lose um, uh, consciousness or feeling a little bit lethargic. And that is what we need to prevent because it's at risk. So, in general, the, those that boys, of uh, prednisone or the flaza code, that, that, that boys with Duchenne received of, uh, are definitely higher than the normal production of steroids in a normal person who is not on treatment. And therefore, usually, the oral dose of steroids they receive protects them even in case of uh, mild, moderate physical stress. So these are things that are important not to panic about this. At the same time, we, in general, we advise that in case of moderate uh, stress, they might require an extra dose of steroid. And this extra dose, in general, is safe. So if you take an extra dose of steroid when you don't need it, it's less dangerous than to not take the extra dose of steroid if you need it. And I hope that is clear. There are different ways to give the steroid. Uh, in case of uh, this um, uh, stressful uh, situation. One of them is the hydrocortisone, uh, um, uh, injection of hydrocortisone intramuscularly. That is what is the uh, hydrocortisone emergency pack. The, in this case, usually the recommendation is to take it during moderate or severe illnesses or when the patient cannot keep uh, down the oral steroid, so has a recurrent hepatitis. So the general advice is that if someone has a common cold or a feeling not 100%, the dose of steroid that they usually take orally should perfectly cover the need of steroid. However, if they develop more severe symptoms, which include high temperature or flu-like symptoms, a bad head cold, um, or uh, feeling lethargic, in that case, I think that it is uh, safer to take this extra dose of hydrocortisone IM. If the patient is able, so this is one of the, um, uh, of the way to administer an hydrocortisone, is it also possible to compensate in a way the need of extra steroid in other way, such as hydrocortisone, oral hydrocortisone, or increasing the dose of the steroid that patients are already taking. These are all valid methods. In general, the hydrocortisone allows us to better control the dose that is required, but all of these strategies aim to cover the stressful situation and potential risk of adrenal crisis. 
The hydrocortisone IM is, the, is one of the easiest ways to administer steroid in case of repeated vomiting when either the steroid or hydrocortisone oral cannot be taken. So in case of vomit, when the patient cannot keep uh, the, the medication down, usually what we advise is to try again within an hour, but if they vomited again, then is when we need to have other way to administer steroids such as hydrocortisone, hydrocortisone IM. Wow, thank you so much, Brigitte. There's quite a lot of information there, but this webinar will be, will be on our website. So no, no, it's very, very useful. Thank you. So if anybody wants to listen back to that, um, it will be on our website. Um, Alex, I think you have a question that's um, more of a general question, not necessarily related to this slide, but do you want to go ahead? Yeah, we've had another question. Um, so it's this question, Michaela. We have an adult daughter living at home with us. She is a manifesting carrier of Duchenne and taking a daily dosage of Prodisolone. Is she considered to be high risk and what extent should we be shielding her? So there is one boy who is, has Duchenne and the sister that, sorry to repeat, but I can still no, struggle. So the sister has, is a carrier? No. And no, is she... Sorry, I'll repeat it again. So they've got, um, it's from a parent who has an adult daughter. Um, she's a manifesting carrier and taking a daily dosage of Prodisolone. They want to know yeah. if the daughter is considered to be high risk and if she should be practicing shielding. Please go back to my initial uh, discussion. Uh, in general, as for any patient with Duchenne dystrophy and on steroid, we uh, advise um, shielding. This is a general advice, it's not the government guidance and is not a legal binding in a way, but we would advise the shielding because she is a manifesting carrier and the fact that she's on a daily dosage of prednisone means that she has neuromuscular symptoms. So I would say that there is no major difference between a boy with the Shannon steroid and this patient. Thank you. Thanks, Michaela. Thanks, Alex. Okay, so we're going on to our final slide now, Michaela. Um, and we're slightly changing tack because um, not only our, oh no, hold on, sorry. Um, in, in visual emergency care plan, I think we've covered that. So um, let's move on because not only are you um, a wonderful neuromuscular consultant, you're also um, extremely involved and engaged in research in the UK, um, being a PI amongst other things of the bromorolone study that is ongoing. Um, and you also help us a lot working with the DMD hub to try and bring more clinical trials to the UK. Um, so we just wondered if we could take a moment, and I know you've got to rush to another clinic, I think we've got five minutes left, um, whether we could just catch up with you on what impact COVID-19 will have on research. Um, I know that most likely this is going to be a case by case situation for each child who is on a clinical trial or adult on a clinical trial. Um, but perhaps you could just give us an overview and just starting off with um, whether you're aware of any active trials that have or will be impacted by COVID-19. Yeah, I, I feel comfortable in a way to say that although it's really case by case either for this study in for specific circumstances side by side, the general message is that all clinical trials are likely to be somehow impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, these can be reflected in different ways. Um, several sites, uh, not, not all of them, but several sites have to have discontinued um, clinical trial visit at this site. So patients are not allowed to go into the hospital for having their study visit completed. In other cases, this has, in some cases, this has an impact on the assessment that can be performed, or in other cases, this makes it impossible for the, 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 the study staff to administer the drug, and therefore the study drug might be discontinued. Um, there are, so in, in, in different way, but there is an impact in all cases. The general message is that, uh, first of all, just I think uh, on the last of Friday, it was released yesterday, both or Monday this week, both the EMEA and the FDA 
has provided some guidance about clinical trial during the COVID-19 outbreak, uh, which provides some information both for sites and sponsors about how to manage and what the regulator would accept in view of the um, unique circumstances. Um, the problem here is that while there's been uh, obviously more action in terms of clinical care, the guidance about uh, how to manage clinical trial are still relatively vague and probably will be in the next couple of weeks and we will have a more standardized approach. The most important thing is that whatever the solution is that can be to discontinue study visits, but continue study medication, discontinue study medication, or putting on hold study medication, or organize study visits, the priority is in guaranteeing the safety of the patient. And there is no different process that might be done by different sites, or patient by patient, or study by study, but the, 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 the focus is that whatever the choice is, the safety of the patient must be guaranteed. And we always have to remember that these are clinical trials, and therefore part of the risk assessment is based on the information that are available regarding the safety of the drug based on preclinical and clinical data available so far. And the second thing is regarding how can we uh, maintain the safety monitor of the patient. There is a lot of intention to try our best, both from the sponsor, the regulator, and the, uh, the, the site to continue the study as much as, we, as much as we can. But if this interferes with the safety of the patient, different choices might need to be made. Okay, Michaela, I'm having a, we're having a bit of difficulty hearing you. It's, it's getting a little bit muffled, but if I could just try and um, sum up what you just said is that I think what you were saying is that the priority here is the safety of the patient, and that really needs to override any demands that may be being made um, by a clinical trial. I did want to ask you something. Um, we were contacted by a, a mum last week whose son is on a trial that, that involves um, a monthly infusion and um, she was invited to the hospital to to have the infusion but um, she felt that this went against the shielding advice. Um, if, if a clinical site says, says that you can come in and there won't be anybody in, in, the, in the room where you have the infusion and, and that you know, um, shielding measures will be carried out in the hospital for your child. What would your advice be? It really depends on the circumstances and we need to trust the sites because it depends on how the hospital is settled and whether they can guarantee, let's say, COVID-19 isolated area where the staff that is providing the care of the patient during that visit is dedicated, so as, as been exposed to other patients or in other emergency situation or not, how the patient will travel to the hospital. So there are several aspects that need to take into account in order to make that decision. And these really need to be discussed uh, with the, uh, the, the PI at the site that is performing the site. And that is what the, the study. And that is why different sites might make a slightly different situation. It's possible that within the next two weeks or the next week or tomorrow, we will have a different guidance from the government or different guidance from the uh, um, R&D, or people will start to be more redeployed, medical staff. So the circumstances also change quite rapidly. And therefore, it's very difficult to provide a general advice. The good reassuring point is that at least at the moment, I have not heard about any sponsor that has the intention to stop a study because of the COVID-19. So study visit can be put on hold, study drug administration might be put on hold. There is no intention for a sponsor at the moment to stop the studies. And therefore, we hope to be able to restart as soon as the situation allows this. Well, that's a, a lovely positive message to end on, Michaela. Thank you so much. I know you've got to get off to clinic now. Um, so with one minute to spare, thank you so much for giving us your time. Please do stay safe and good luck in the coming weeks. And I think um, I speak on behalf of everyone by saying thank you for everything you do for this community. You work tirelessly, so not only seeing patients in clinic, but behind the scenes doing so much work that people don't even see, but it's so highly valued. So thank you so, so much and stay safe. Thank you to you all. Thank you. Bye. Bye.
Um, so to everyone still listening, I hope um, that answered your questions. Um, we probably didn't manage to cover everything that people wanted, but we will go through them after this webinar and look at including them in our next one. But before we go, we just wanted to share some useful resources with you because we've been asked a lot about what financial help might be available to families. And um, Alex found out about the charity Carers UK, which has some useful links, which we hope will give you some information that we haven't been able to provide. Um, and we've just put it on our website now. So please do go to that after this webinar and you might be able to get some useful information there. Um, also, just to update you that we've been working with other charities in the UK to get some consolidated and consistent guidance from the neuromuscular experts, some of whom lead the North Star Network. And in the last half an hour, they've just issued some revised guidelines, partly in response to some questions we put to them as a group of charities last week. And this too has just gone on our website, so do take a look. Um, there are also these websites, which many of you have probably seen already. There's the Duchenne Emergency, the Family Guide, which covers all aspects of DMD and that what does each stage. And there's the government website and the NHS website for updates on Corona. Uh, My Cortisol app is very useful if you have your hydrocortisone pack. And the World Duchenne Organisations has lots of information on their website. So if you have any questions that have arisen from today or any new questions, then do please get in touch with us at support at The subjects don't have to be COVID-19 related, so do let us know what you'd like to understand more about or catch up on during these next few weeks and months. And so do remember what the government advice is to stay safe. This is a moment of national emergency. Stay at home, protect our NHS and save lives. Thank you so much for listening and we'll see you again next time. Bye-bye.